Oh my god, it's Mind Pump time! Exciting, as usual here at Mind Pump, because we're giving away more stuff. Today's giveaway, Maps Aesthetic Easily, one of our most popular workout programs. Bodybuilding Inspired. By the way, this is the program that Adam used to get in shape and compete as a professional physique competitor. And he looked amazing. Sexy guy. All right, so here's how you can win Maps Aesthetic. Leave a comment the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. If we pick your comment, we'll let you know underneath, and you'll win free access to Maps Aesthetic. But you also need to subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. One more thing. We're running a sale on two very popular, very effective muscle building and especially strength building programs, Maps Strong and Maps Powerlift, both 50 percent off. Go check them out. Head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code August Special for that discount. All right? Enjoy the show. Dude, we got the green light. Yeah. That's, that's like He's going to love hanging out with my son, bro. I tell it, you, my son's destined to be What if I had the athlete? If he wants to be like a jock well, rocker. Yeah. yeah. You got yeah, it looks like you got an got. artist on your hands. And then what if I had the athlete? How weird would that be? <laughs> <laughs> that would be weird, dude. <laughs> That's my son's like, dude, my head would explode. Like, Adam, yeah. can you like help my kid out? And I don't know, Justin will help yours out. No I'm matter either, how much I try, to cross parent here, push the the sport, the basketball, football, golf, baseball thing. I mean, we got it all. Uh, he's just drawn to music, man. Yeah. I could not believe he dances. He, he, he loves took it. to drums like dude, uh, he, water. Huh? We were at we were at Katrina's mom's house. We were celebrating the new backyard that just got done, and um, they had a live band there and everything. And Katrina said he was like he kept going over to the equipment and you know how people are with their stuff like you don't want somebody else's random two-year-old grabbing your guitar your tr so she kept like having to get him and finally the guy's like no no it's, it's okay go ahead and let him i have a nephew and he doesn't he's not interested in it at all so it's it's cute to see some kid that's interested he walks over first time ever in person seeing a drum set like that grabs the stick and just starts playing, dude. I know. Yeah. I know you showed us the video. Yeah. That that, that doesn't look like a natural like fit, dude. Yep. He was actually holding them well. Oh, like, yeah. Tapping. Yeah, do, yeah. yeah. Doing all of them. Not just like hitting on one. like symbol. Like, yeah. Like, He's oh my. hitting the snare. Yeah. And I've said it since the beginning, right? So like to, still to this day, I can't get him to sit still for 30 minutes watching his favorite cartoon. But he will watch music videos for hours mm. or until he falls asleep. Like that's one of the ways that he falls asleep with the me. only shame is that you have him listen to country all the time. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> we got to expose sure him to other genres. I sure should don't want him listening to the hip hop stuff that's out there yeah, right now. No, that's I true. definitely don't want to influence him with that that's way. True. And the, he's just, I tried to play some hard rock and maybe some classic rock to see if he gets into it. He'll listen to some of it. He's like, he likes Justin Timberlake too. So he's a little into some poppy mm. stuff like yeah. that. Little Michael Jackson, he liked a little we'll throw bit. Throw some rockabilly in there, but know. he loves. I think the what he loves about back. country is the instruments. Oh, really? Yeah, I think he loves. You know, I don't like this country music, but I like the sentiment. That's always very <laughs> good. You know what I mean? Like good messages. What yeah, I'm like, saying. Uh, Hardy oh, okay. people. What do yeah. you think I was meant? I don't know what you meant by the <laughs> sentiment. <laughs> uh, I didn't know where you were What's going. What's that with, word with, mean? With, it, with, it, with, with that. <laughs> it was like our exercise today. You guys trying yeah. to get me to succession. I'm like, what? What are you talking yeah, about? Is this some kind of rock formation? Yeah. Like, I, everybody what, gets what everybody gets uh, Spon SpongeBob, Michael Jordan, and all stuff like that. Yeah. I, I, I get yeah. So people don't even know this, right? So once a week we have a. Uh, Somebody who comes in and does improv training with us to help us be better on the show. It's a black. I thought we Which told was, the audience. We didn't tell did we audience? tell them? I thought yeah, we might. That was them. Justin's uh, yeah. um, suggestion. I thought it was brilliant, uh, and it's great. It's a lot of fun. It's funny. It's challenging. Now, you, do you guys yeah. have a favorite uh, exercise that we do of all the ones that we do? Mm, I mean, I like the the latest one where you're doing the press conference. So you're kind of alluding to. Yeah, that's one of my favorites, just because you don't know what is going on and it's like you have to kind of like feed off the questions to be able to put it all together i don't know i, I like it yeah, that's probably my favorite dude so this morning i'm working out right and uh andrew's in here working out with us he's the guy producing our youtube uh videos and he's uh doing did you see him doing tricep press downs I was not watching. Looked like a horse kicked the back of his arm. Oh, yeah. He's yes. got a nice yeah. little horseshoe. I was just telling him, though. I said, I said, you've been really consistent lately. He said, yeah, I know. I'm trying to. He's falling strong right now. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And he's doing good. I was watching him do the high pulls. He's doing you know extras. Like, damn, this is impressive. And then I realized something. We got a badass team here. So so mm. let's, let's, let's run down the list here. Chokey's strong as hell. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so is Olivia. Olivia, our intern, strong as hell. Yeah. Then we got Gio. He's a brown belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Eli is, I think, purple or brown belt or almost there in jiu-jitsu. Like, we got, we got some badasses. We're but training for media wars. There's one rule, though, that 
uh, I told them, and I'm sure you guys support, like you can get strong and all that stuff. If you surpass any of the owners in <laughs> yeah, strength, you're yeah, fired yeah. immediately. Yeah. We don't allow that. Yeah, we're going to cut you. <laughs> Our egos won't let you do that. No, but it was cool. It was, it's cool to see everybody like really kicking ass. Yeah, it's there's cool something in the water it. right now. I think everybody's been uh, pretty consistent. I, this is the most consistent, the uh, four of us all at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. We tend to all have like our, our moments where one of us is more consistent than the other, but I'd say this is the the most consistent everybody's been. Yeah, I, the, the benefits of consistency, besides obviously physical benefits, I think the main ones are mental. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but the more consistent you are with your training, just the more consistently your mood is positive, I would say. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, the energy is totally different. I, yeah. yeah, I feed off that. And plus, like, too, uh, memory recall for me is so much better when, when I'm, like, physically Isn't that weird? active. Yeah. It, well, it's not weird once you know well, the I mean, science. It, yeah, it makes sense. Once but. you know the science, but it's 100% true. This is why artists, uh, writers, musicians, when they get block, when they have writer's block or they're stuck, what do they always do? Yeah, they go for a walk or move. Yeah, move, yeah. They got to move. Or, yeah, absolutely. Now, speaking of good energy, so I'm, you know, getting my my due done by Vicky, our, our awesome barber, and she plays great music, right? So '90s hip hop. So I'm listening yeah. to it, and Bone Thug Just comes up. Remember it. Bone Thug? Oh yeah. Oh, boom, 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 boom. boom. I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Okay, I love them. Right? Yeah. They're they're they were great. Uh, I love that era. But I'm listening to music, and then we're talking about music, and she's talking about how. She's cutting hair for 10 hours a day, and it's really important the kind of music that you play. And then it made me think, like, there's definitely things I miss about managing gyms that I didn't realize that were that I would ever miss, right? So obviously I'm not in a gym, working out all the time. Yeah, you're going to miss that, all that stuff. But the the big one of the main things I miss is music being on in the background all the time. Yeah. No, I, that's true. It's a good point, too. Plus, you get exposed to a lot of music you normally wouldn't listen to uh, because it just, I don't even listen to the radio. That used to be the thing because the radio just is littered with stupid commercials and, uh, like COVID information you've heard drilled into your brain a thousand million times. So yeah. I, I turn radio off. I'm just listening to my own playlist. I'm so sick of it. Yeah. yeah. There's not a lot of professions that allow you to listen to music all day long. All day. Yeah. It was always on in the background to the point where, especially in the early days, when the the music was being piped in through, this was the early days of like satellite, where you know, and then there was radio before that. You would hear some of the same songs come on. Now, if I hear certain songs, it'll literally take me back to a time when I managed gyms. Like I'll hear a specific song, and I'll remember working the front desk, you know, at Hillsdale, uh, which is a you know location twenty four, or I'm training a particular client. Mm -hmm. But I miss that. I miss music in the background all the time because I don't think I don't think I realized how much of an impact that had on positivity and mood and productivity. Just having that on in the background. Well, oh, uh, I imagine the music that you're that they're choosing in gyms too, or is upbeat and positive. Mm -hmm. Of course, I, the mm -hmm. opposite could happen too, right? If you're listening to like <laughs> angry, <laughs> play sad music all the time. Yeah, 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 sad music or angry music all the time. I would think that would have, <laughs> you uh, imagine people <laughs> doing cardio to sad music. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that's what's playing, though. You know, say when I when I get on the, that's what I feel is playing in my head. <laughs> you want like sad country metal because you know, yeah. you're killing the fat. Yeah, yeah. that's what's going on. Oh, no, man. but I I miss that. Is there anything that you guys miss from working in the gym that you the competitive atmosphere? Yeah, that's true, I love huh? that. That was my favorite. My favorite was good looking people. Do I have to say it? I I did. Did. Yeah, that. Yeah. That's Wait, hold on a second. What do you mean you miss that? I'm just saying. Take a look around. I forget dude. you guys. I see you guys outside. Dude. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, okay, good looking so, other people. All right. So specifically, good looking, not us. Yes, yeah. is what you're saying. That's all what right. I'm saying. I yeah. felt that the the gym atmosphere, uh, and I wasn't ready for it to be that way, was a lot like uh, team sports. There, mm -hmm. I, I I felt a lot of parallels to the competitive atmosphere with that, right? You have a team together, even though you guys are uh, somewhat competitors, when you think about it, trainers are all fishing from the same pond, mm -hmm. but yet there's a, a team aspect of it that you're not, you're not competitive with them. So very similar to what that's like when you're playing a sport, you guys practice every day against each other to get better at what you guys do. You all have a common goal, right? So the mm -hmm. GM or the fitness manager is driving the team towards a common goal. Uh, getting everybody to move in the same direction, the same challenge there is with with getting sports. There's always the outliers that are paying the ass, like uh, building people up and developing them. There's so much of the uh, the sport and team aspect that I that I felt played into uh, working. It in a was gym. it was very competitive. It was also dynamic because yeah. when you're running a gym, people are constantly coming in and out, so it's never 
static. It's not like working in an office. I've, I've worked in offices for very short periods of time. didn't last because I couldn't stand it. But they tend to be static. Same people, same thing. Gyms are never like that. There's definitely trends and things you see. But so many people are in and out. Stuff is happening all the time. It's also why this is one thing I miss, but I also don't miss. You need a lot of energy working in a gym. It just doesn't work to go in there and be chill. You're just always go, go, go. Here's something else I really miss that it's, it's hilarious. I'm sure it makes sense once I say it. I miss the intercom. <laughs> I miss being able to get on the you intercom. You miss hearing yourself? I, no. You got this I now, I still bro. hear myself. No? No, <laughs> wait, I, I feel like we've been to a gym and then like the first thing Sal did was went and like, attention. Yeah, I did. Attention. <laughs> I can hear myself yeah. in the <laughs> building <laughs> right now. Bro, I used to have so much fun on the intercom. Like my, I used to love selling apparel, supplements, and then saying shit to make my staff laugh yeah. on the internet. It was one of my favorite things. Did you get, Did you guys do the no, intercom? No, I did. I messed around with it, but I didn't have the same infatuation with it as oh, you Oh, I had a blast. It, yeah. I, <laughs> had a, I had a yeah. But it makes total sense. You're also the one that listens to the podcast the most, too. So yeah. you're the most consistent with that. Fast so. forward, you guys. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that's that. I 100% believe that. That's not true. That. <laughs> that's not true at all. You know what else I, I kind of yeah, miss? You're right, Sal. Yeah. I kind of miss the excitement of... Like having to call, <laughs> this sounds fucked up, ambulances and police. Oh, God. Well, I mean, when you're, listen, when you're running a gym, wow. at least, look, okay, let me ask you a question. When you, you guys manage clubs, how often would you have to call an ambulance or police on once a regular basis? Yeah, I mean, it's once, happened. once a week. Yeah, yeah probably once a week. That's People kind of passing exciting. out. And, <laughs> I, I mean, I guess. <laughs> it's the adrenaline gun. I mean, I actually never liked that. So, I mean, I was always nervous that I was going to have to go try and save somebody. I didn't like oh, the, I, I didn't like the pressure of that. I didn't like the pressure of somebody could pass out right next to me. I never had to do CPR, luckily, but I yeah. most certainly dreaded the thought of having oh. to that oh. somebody's lives being yeah. in my hand i've seen a few people drop on the treadmill and just get like, fired off cold <laughs> yeah it was like that was not yeah pleasant to, dude to watch. i saw a lady get fired off the treadmill because i think she was hitting the wrong button i've told the story a long time i think yeah. she was hitting the button and, I th and she was hitting speed up oh not God. slow down yeah. and you know how no 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 yes so old school treadmills they're better now they're much more responsive now and now they have where you attach like something to your clothes so if you get too far away it automatically turns it off mm -hmm. but the old school treadmills this is back in 1998 99 when I'm first run they you had to hit the stop button and if you didn't it don't give a shit what you're doing that thing's gonna keep running and they're strong mm -hmm. and so this woman was on there and I could see her because back then that one of the first clubs I, I worked in. The front desk was here, and the cardio was right over there across the way. And I, I was, you know, you watch the cardio, you check people in. I'm a trainer. I'm trying to get people to, to set up goal assessments and stuff like that. And I see this lady, and she's this older Asian woman and big glasses, and she's walking on the treadmill. But I'm noticing she's walking like I don't know if she can keep up with that speed. And I see her doing this, like hitting the button. And she's going faster, and I'm like, oh, shit, she's hitting Trying this. to make up for it with the swivel. She, Yeah, she's yeah. hitting the speed up button. And so yeah. she starts to lose her, and I yell across, hit, hit, someone hit the stop button. And people, by the way, I've seen many people go down on treadmills and fall off cardio. Nobody helps them, ever. People continue doing cardio. I've seen it happen like 10 times. So, Nobody stops. They so look rude. over. Oh. Yeah. And they keep doing the thing. Wow, that sucks for you. Yeah. So I'm yelling, like, hit the stop button, hit the stop button. And she fucking loses her footing. But here's the worst part. She held on. So she held on. Uh. And the treadmill is still running. And it's pulling her pants off. It's fucking. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, yeah, dude. Finally. So it's like. <laughs> Was this at Hillsdale? This Whoa. Hillsdale. The old one. This is before they redid oh, it. Oh, the old one. Now, this is when they had racquetball and they had a women's gym. Because there's only a few options once you know you're going to eat shit, right? Because like, I've seen where you know the, the feet start getting lazy and, <laughs> and they stop and then it's boosh, your face plant oh, right on you know, bro, the she, treadmill. She held on for a good three seconds. I start running over there. It's pulling her, her like workout pants off or whatever. And then she lets go and then it fires her off into the wall. And I was like, wow, that was hilarious. So at She Hills, was okay, though. At Hillsdale, I watched a Tourette's kid get launched and bounced off of the Group X room because they had the last row of treadmills. And so if you can imagine... The, what, what does Tourette's wait, have to do with this story? Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> well, he was a Tourette's kid. Like, he literally, like... would so this, he just I, walk I, around going, like, fuck ass. Yeah, no. I, I, he was, like, uh, 16, 17 years old. I remember his parents came in, signed them up. He, like, they sat down and met to let us know. So, obviously... He's going to say some shit. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Like that. So, we were... And we were totally used to... We knew. I can't remember the kid's name. It's been so long. 
but we'd come in, say hi to them. We always kept an eye on them for for them and stuff like that. Yeah. And then we'd always let members know that we're nearby if they were because you get complaints and stuff that he has Tourette's and. Mm. So he would run on the treadmill time, and then randomly you hear him swearing and stuff. It was totally normal. But he always went to the back row, So and he did it in the late morning when it wasn't really busy and stuff. And he was running on the very back row, and the very back row right behind the treadmill, literally three feet, maybe four feet tops, is the glass for the Group X. And I remember one time you hear the, oh, oh fuck. Yeah, you hear the <laughs> cuss word real quick. And then and you just thought it was normal, right? Oh, yeah. Just and then you see him, boom, and get yeah. launched and then shot. Because you hit that thing. If it's like speed eight plus. Oh, it'll, it'll fire. Oh, yeah, it'll, yeah, he just he skipped right off of it and slammed into the, the plexiglass afterwards. Dude, wor <laughs> worst thing, and this is the, I've seen lots of accidents, but this one made me feel the worst. So we had, you know, you have physio balls. Remember when that first became a thing? Because they weren't in gyms at first. When I first went, worked in gyms, you, physio ball was not a thing. Then all of a sudden, they became a thing, and they were everywhere. Yeah. And we had one, and one of my operations guys said, hey, Sal, someone brought to my attention that this one has a cut in it. Now, it's, it's still okay, <laughs> but it might burst. Yeah. I said, put it somewhere where members aren't going to use it. Well, this moron put it in the Group X room up high, but it looked like you could – I mean, this is what happened. So member signs up heavy heavy set woman and she specifically asked my sales guy specifically can i sit on one of those physio balls i'm kind of heavy can i use them or, or and he goes no 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 they're tested for like a thousand pounds totally safe which ball do you think she grabbed <laughs> no. the one that was almost broken and she blew it up oh, man. yeah and you hear a big old and i felt so bad for her <laughs> on the ground big old ball exploded i was like oh my <laughs> god dude anyway i got her to buy some training after that because hey thought, did either one of yeah, you guys I, work I, I didn't get a chance Naturally. to read the article but i was interested in because it, i thought it was an, uh, at least it got me clickbaity is what the title the the pork in california thing was it jerry or or um uh, who sent yeah, it over I to mean, us this morning yeah that's the thing the title got me which i'm like you are not touching my bacon yeah. Like, what is happening? <laughs> that's <laughs> probably what you exactly said. So, okay, so you guys read it? No, that's, that's why I'm asking. So, I'll, look, I'll pull it up because I don't want um, to misrepresent it. Um, but California passed a proposition, I'm going to name the proposition, that essentially gave guidelines to how, you know, pork and chicken and all these animals are raised and essentially how we can produce some of these foods. And I can't remember what the proposition is. It's a, it's oh, uh, it, it's it's called uh, Animal Welfare Proposition. It was approved, and it gave rules and laws for how much space these animals needed and how they should. And it's it's a, one of those feel good propositions that people mm, passed. Right. The problem is only four percent of hog operations comply with the new rules. Oh wow. Now Calif this means that California not only won't allow animals in California to be raised this way and slaughtered this way. But it also means they won't sell anything that's raised or slaughtered this way. Wow. So now we've just shrunk the market down to 4% of producers. And this is the problem with, with feel-good laws and propositions is that nobody thinks further than this feels good. Because now here's the problem. Eggs, bacon, milk, these are staples for a lot of people. And yeah. especially people in low income, this is oftentimes the only unprocessed food that they eat. Well, didn't you, And now it's going to make them super expensive. Don't you think this is the, the natural progression of where we're going? If it's not going to be, if it's non-regenerative farming, it's going to get taxed at a higher rate or outlawed potentially. Like, don't you think we're moving this direction anyways? I, well, so yeah. And but here's, again, here's the issue with that is that sometimes things feel good and we don't consider the potential ramifications. So imagine your low income family. Yeah. You're supporting your kids. 90% of what you Shrinking buy- Shrinking supplies substantially. Yeah, so 90% of what you buy is processed garbage because it's cheap, it's easy to, to buy. But hey, my kids still drink milk. I still can buy them eggs. I can still buy them bacon. Oh my God, bacon now is five times as expensive or not available. So are eggs. I'm not going to do it anymore. So we don't consider- uh, some of these. Some now, did of these the article issues. go into the prediction of that? I mean, what four percent of, of of producers? Yeah, we're just going to cause a big shortage if they if they don't change it. And it'll only be California though that have that. So you're going to have like a black market for bacon. Yeah. Well, uh, the, here's the Justin? other issue. Ca California is black such a big market. market. <laughs> My ears just perked up. I know. <laughs> California is such a big market that it could cause problems for other states as well. Remember, we're one of the biggest markets for anything. Oh, because it'll, we'll have to shut down even the farming. I mean, they're going to shut down. We can't, they can't, te technically they won't be able to, those farms can't sell to Minnesota. They They'll can. be able, they can, but because they're not selling to California 
and let's say you're a, a producer of bacon in California by itself. Thirty percent of your yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, that may, exactly. I wonder what I wonder how what percentage that is. Yeah. So now now companies like ButcherBox, uh, I think you know you're 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 gonna see like them benefit right because mm -hmm. they probably fall under that small category of companies that meets all these requirements. Now the demand's gonna explode. Yeah. For, for I stuff mean, do like you this. think that this could just be a transition period though, where yeah, it's going to hurt at first. There'll be a major shortage, but then it's going to drive a lot of people into better farming practices. I mean, I figure that's the desired outcome of this, right? I mean, the, eventually, it isn't just a tax or fuck everybody. It's eventually, a, but you have to consider the downstream uh, consequences and what happens in the meantime. Yeah, understandably. But if the if the desired outcome is to move towards regenerative farming and doing things like that. What do you suggest is the best transition? Yeah. Well, let me put it this way. I don't probably make massive moves like this when we're already in economic crisis. Like, yeah. like we're already hurting from, you know, small businesses are getting destroyed I mean, are we everywhere. Though? And now let's just do this. Is it really an economic crisis right it now? It is for there's everybody more, else. There's isn't more money tech. in people's savings yeah. account than ever. Housing prices are yeah. going through the roof. Stocks are going up like crazy. Well, I'm, I'm throwing, just talking we're giving from out a small business for vaccine perspective. shots now. I mean, is it yeah. really that much of an economic crisis right now? Yeah. I mean, not for big <laughs> business. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. And speaking of uh, speaking of which, um, so and I'm just I'm not an expert in this, so this is just my own experience. I now uh, I, I didn't know very many people who got COVID up until recently. Now I know like ten people. Yeah. All of them got were vaccinated. Yeah. Every single one of them had the vaccine. This is kind of an interesting situation, right? Because they're saying that they can now spread. This new variant, like anybody else, yeah. this is really going to hurt their credibility. Because, well, this and is, I mean, to their credit, they had no idea of knowing this. It's the other variant, right? First of all, yeah. so so, and then I mean, I'm sure there's a, a pretty good explanation. You got to think that people that get vaccinated are now probably they went from being staying home, masked up if they go anywhere, ordering in most time, and then now they get the vaccine, so they feel like they can go all back to normal life. But they, they can't. Yeah, they can't, but they did, I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure a lot of people that got vaccinated felt like they have superpowers now and that they don't have to worry about anybody else, and that's proving to not be true now. No. So. Mm. No, it's wild. And what and what, what it hurts is the credibility of the people who've been pushing it because the truth is they don't know, right? Yeah, it's There's no way of knowing. Know. But because they sold it so hard, first they sold the uh, flatten the curve two weeks to flatten the curve. Obviously, now we're like a year and something later. Mm. Then they said, you know, get the vaccine. You don't have to wear masks now. You have to also. It's going to get to the point where people aren't going to listen anymore. That's not a good situation to be in. Yeah, you're you're losing credibility, authority, and like, yeah, it, it, that's the thing. It's like, who do you turn to now for like a real, like legitimate information in terms of, you know, disease prevention? Yeah, I don't know. Well, man, speaking of other wild, crazy things, I got to share these numbers. I was sharing with Sal off air. I didn't share with you or just with, have to bring this with up. Doug. I have to bring it up for sure. I just think, I think it's like, un I read it today and it blew my mind. I mean, as much as I, I'm in and reading stuff around real estate, this is a, a number and a, stat, a stat I was unaware of, and I'm, I think it's crazy. So we, uh, up until the 08 crisis, right, in the, the big crash or recession then, we were on average building 2 million homes per year. Since then, because of that and everything, that because of the big crash, we freaked out and we slowed that down on average to 500 to 600,000 homes. So production way down. Yeah. What, for the Just last dropped. decade, we've been down right now. Then we had the pandemic hit and we shut down a bunch of stuff. So we are currently based off of trends on how many new homes that we need to supply the normal demand. We're behind by 3.8 million homes. Mm -hmm. And on average, we're only doing 500 to 600,000 per year. Then you add in the fact millennials are up and coming right now, which are the, is the biggest buying percentage of people that we've ever had hit the market. Mm. And then in addition to that, you have baby boomers right now, 44% of them still have a hold of all the homes, and yet they only represent 28% of the- And general. they're not getting rid of their houses. And they're not no, getting so rid of their yeah, houses. They're, they're working longer and they're healthier. So you have this, I mean, we've already talked about all the crazy things, and then you have moratoriums that are being pushed back even further. So this crazy surge of home sales does not- You don't look, think it's going away anytime soon. It, well, it it can't. Yeah. Unless something like the to sound point, being they met. do something like which they've already said they're not going to. So they're not going to raise interest rates from. No, from, they they won't unless they have to. Right. Because if you're the one responsible for raising interest rates, you are not getting elected again. And so what is cost and, and what does the yeah. and what what will make have to like what does that look like? Well, well, the 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 only thing that we have to compare as an example would be what happened in the '70s with 
inflation. We had double digit inflation. They did lots of things to try to slow it down. Finally, what only thing that got it in check was to raise interest rates. So we would have to see inflation would have to be bad enough where people would demand something be done. That's it. There's no political pressure. In other words, right now there is no political pressure to change interest now, rates. Now, when that happened, it's the opposite. now that you know, I agree. That's it's not happening right now. Now, when that happened, do you know what was that the greatest decline in the dollar? So here's what you saw when they raised interest rates. You saw no, before a- they before that, like because like obviously they did it for a reason because we went on this oh. radical run of inflation. Yeah. What I'm asking you is during that time, was that one of the highest runs or, or declines in the, the value of the dollar? You saw, uh, yes, you saw a pretty, pretty big decline in the dollar, although we're printing much more now, but you did see a decline in the purchasing price. Uh, power of so the that's dollar. part of what's interesting. What's going on right now is we are completely staying steady because the entire world this happened to the pandemic and everybody. Why do you say we're staying staying steady? Look at the look at the dollar right now. Look at the value of the dollar in relation to the previous decades and to where it is right now. It's not losing. Inflation's not, uh, uh, higher now than it's been in in, a, in decades. Well, Peter that, Lindemann. Right? That doesn't that's necessarily mean that doesn't necessarily mean the dollar is losing value. That's exactly what that means. No, it, inflation can happen in other areas. It can happen in assets and other things besides just the. That's dollar. exactly what it means, though. If the dollar, if one dollar buys you a product, and then the next month a dollar. 50 buys you the but same if product, that means the dollar lost worldwide value. and everybody's so feeling it is, the same. So, what it, you're saying is if everybody sucks, then we're cool. <laughs> <laughs> we're the top of the shit pile. That's actually the worst possible case scenario. If the whole world experiences this massive value, devaluing of, of currencies, there's nowhere to turn. That's a very bad situation. That's not the Which worst falls case scenario. Worst case scenario next, would be uh, are we losing the, the dollar losing value while we're also printing all that money. That would be worse. It's still well, that's what's happening. Yeah, but that's that that's not though, in comparison to the rest of the world. That's what I'm saying. Are you if, talking about currencies, how they're pegged against each other? Yes. For example, the yen and the dollar. Yes. Yeah, but I don't think that's an indication of the value of the currency. No. The uh, the currency's declining, I think it's probably declining world wide the purchasing power and that's the inflation that we're seeing yeah so it may be the yen and the dollar are still pegged at the same amount of the yen and the euro but we're still seeing a decline in purchasing power of a single dollar okay let me put it this way in 2008 we exported a lot of some of our issues by other countries buying treasuries buying and putting their faith in our dollar if everybody tanks we had nowhere to go so that's a bad, that's a really bad situation. Inflation is bad right now. But again, in, in the 70s, when they corrected it or tried to fix it by raising interest rates, you did see a contraction in the economy. Now, the contraction was followed by growth because you either handle the pain now or you handle the pain later and the pain just gets worse later on. So that's, now here's the deal. When is it going to happen? Who fucking knows? I have no idea. Yeah, well, so the theory is that, and I'm listening, I'm, by the way, too, like I'm not listening to like an economist like Peter Schiff who has an interest in people buying gold. Sure. This is uh, NPR news that I'm listening to. That, yeah, because they're non-biased. Well, I mean, every, everybody's te- everybody's <laughs> technically biased, but what's, yeah. what is NPR trying to sell you? Oh, man. M- so. M- NPR oftentimes, anyway, I get what you're saying, though. I, I think, uh, so essentially we're saying you're listening to mainstream economists. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. not, and, we're, and they're giving out just regular facts and statistics. And the theory is that we couldn't possibly catch up for at least five years to a decade. Yeah. Because you couldn't, we can't build homes fast enough. Yeah. With the amount of people coming up that are buying them, with interest rates as low as you possibly can, your only possibility of slowing that down is to creep up rates like you're saying. That's yeah. it. And and how fast are you going to increase the rates in order to slow that down? The demand is still that That's high. what I'm saying. Predicting when stuff's going to happen. I mean, boy, if you could do that, you're, you know, yeah, it's, like no that du- it's like that dude that predicted the 2008 crash. He's like, it's going to happen. Just don't know when. And if you guys recall, he mm. thought it would happen sooner and almost lost his ass. And then it happened and then he was okay. Very difficult to predict these things, but the, the fundamentals don't change. You know what it's like? This is what it reminds me of when people have these conversations. Because here's the problem. Uh, economy, uh, economics has become politicized. In fact, we're seeing science become politicized as well. And I'll, I'll touch on that in just a second. But economics has been politicized for a long time. So what they'll do is they'll to make their political argument, they spin things. But this is what it reminds me of in our space. It's like you have the people who say... Hey, look! If you go zero carb, you can't. You're not going to gain body fat because it lowers insulin, and insulin 
is the, the thing that stores body fat. And people say, okay, that's partially true, but if you don't have excess calories, you can't store body fat. That's a fundamental you can't get around. Mm-hmm. So with economics, there are fundamentals. The fundamentals being supply, demand, and currency has to be uh, has to represent those things very well. And if it doesn't, at some point down the line, you start to get a correction. So they can spin it however they want. The, here, the, here's the facts. Are there artificial uh, ways of, of constricting the supply of certain products and things? Yes, right now we're doing a lot of that. Are there ways of artificially creating demand, like keeping interest rates super low all the time? That's one way to do it. So is that going to cause distortions in the market that might need to get corrected? Fundamentals will tell you, yeah. When? Who knows? Who, who, I have no idea. I'll tell you this much right now. People who are at the top, who own the assets, are probably going to do okay. Well, yeah, because even if you think of it this way, right? So obviously, we don't think it's crashing tomorrow. Yeah. All right. So it's, it's let's pretend it crashes really soon, which really soon would probably be within a year. Right, that would be really soon. I'd say five years would be soon. I know, right? So, yeah. so, so, let, at the rate it's been going, if it just maintains that rate, even if you see a crash as bad as 08, which I think we, everyone's agreed the the likelihood of that is, I don't know a single economist that thinks that we're on pace to see what we yeah. saw in 08. If even if you were to do that, you even you losing that much percentage in your assets, you're still up. 25 30 yeah. percent that's what's crazy I mean that's how much it's it's those assets have gone up that even when the market corrects itself mm. it's if you bought a year ago or more anywhere beyond that even when the correction happens you're yeah. still going to be sitting on top which makes sense because we've printed that much money in the economy I think the part that's interesting is the people that are all for all the the free programs and the more money and we need everyone needing help don't realize those are the same people that are going to get fucked the most in the situation. Totally. Because all that's going to end up happening is the same buyer habits that have always happened and we know what what consumers do. They get that extra money. It goes right back in the market and it goes back to the people that have the assets, that (laughs) have the companies, that have the houses, that that have all the stock. They end up just getting it. So they just get wealthier and the gap becomes bigger and it's all a temporary mean, but at the same same time disguised as we're helping you oh mm-hmm. hey, listen anytime <laughs> anytime they push a policy so and they say feel this, good policies this is to help the little guy you should always be very very suspicious like when they'll say rent's too expensive so we're going to help the little guy here's what we're going to do we're going to pass laws making raising rent illegal and people are like yay i have an apartment this is great for me now what happens people don't invest in new apartment buildings people don't invest in upgrading their apartment builds you create a shortage of apartments so anybody who wants an apartment now ends up paying higher prices because there's fewer available but the people who have them are helped and it sounds good this is what you got to be careful you know for. another thing they talked about that i thought was interesting was uh boomers being the ones that have 44 percent of the how the housing market also blocking uh, the development of duplexes of and apartments in a lot of areas. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of zoning laws all over the country that even though there's a huge need for more housing, there's not a lot of square footage as far as putting yeah. it. So that you can only build single family homes in a lot of these towns, even though it needs an apartment complex or it needs some duplexes or triplexes. And because they've, they've these towns have passed laws that won't allow them to come in. So you have that uh, working against the, the building of the houses too had no idea that was a major problem but with the boomers being the ones that have a good percentage of the housing market yep. have put that all in place in a well lot of i'm places. telling you dude one of the best one of the most uh, effective strategies for people to make money and create and make themselves protect their wealth is to work with government to create laws that ensure that that'll happen or mm. to eliminate their competition i'll give you an example so the I think the founder of Beyond Meat. I'm, I'm going to look it up just to make sure. So this is the the meat alternative, right? The the the. I can't believe it's not meat. Yeah. Okay. So one of the the founders. And I'm going to look up who it is exactly. He is now backing openly um, a tax on meat. Of course, mm. right? He has a product that replaces meat, so he's going to support taxing. Meat, which is going to make it much more expensive and only do what, right? Mm. Improve his ability to compete yeah, yeah. in the market. I got to make sure I find, maybe Doug can find this guy's, uh, who this, this person is. You can look up uh, like, you know, um, or, you know meat, uh, 
meat guru or something like that or beyond meat guru uh, supporting increasing meat taxes or something like that. So, of course, right? Because if he lobbies and he's and it sounds good, right? No, I, I want to help the environment or whatever. But meanwhile, raises the price of his main competitors, which is meat, and makes him a great alternative. Yeah, which is you know kind of crappy. Ethan Brown. Yeah, and and what does he what does he run or who does he? Uh, yeah, he's Beyond Meat boss. Calls for a tax on meat to encourage shift to plant based food. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? We all just need yeah. to be on plants. <laughs> gym owners, uh, you know, propose a tax for obese people to pay for gym memberships. You know, yeah. something like that, right? <laughs> yeah, convenient. it's so annoying. Uh, speaking of uh, politicizing science, so that episode we did with Carol Hooven, right, on mm-hmm. testosterone. She's in the news. Right oh now. yeah, I yeah, heard you say that. Fire, One but. of her colleagues said that her statements saying that men and women are biologically different and that biology drives some of our behaviors and all that stuff is dangerous and transphobic. Mm. So now she's having to defend all of her research. And by the way, it's not just her research. This is this is mainstream science, or at least it was for a while. She has to defend herself now against all of this. And she's, she's all over the news because... Yeah. Thank God she's a woman. She'd be getting crucified if she was a man. I think that protects getting, her a little bit, right? Oh, just a little bit, though, obviously, because she's still get under heat right now. So it's, it's crazy. It's so crazy to me that scientists are, are getting under... You know, they're under heat for doing science. Uh, uh, you know, it's just... It's a very... Uh, used to be a very pure... Uh, you know, it's objective. Of, yeah, it's, it's objective. It's just like, I'm studying this. You know, I see this in animal behavior. I see this in human behavior. All I'm doing is reporting the facts. Yep. What you has know, money not tainted, though? I mean, religion, politics, science. I mean, you, greed you, and self interest. Yeah, you, say, I yeah. mean, if man is involved in any part of it and there is a place to make a dollar, show me where it hasn't been completely polluted by that's a damn by, good point by corruption yeah. yeah i mean it touches re- everything religion is supposed to be like one of the purest forms of it and we all know there's plenty of examples of religious leaders that have done it to seek power and money and stuff like that so name name me something that doesn't that isn't been completely tainted you're right by that. nothing's yep. immune yeah. that's, that's 100 yeah. speaking of testosterone so ever since we did the uh, aired the episode with Dr. Rand McLean right from regenerative and sport medicine I've gotten messages from people who are already on TRT and already doing hormone replacement therapy. Me too. I told them to still go there and have have him look at it. That's what they wanted. So yeah. what they want, what they're saying is, I want them to assess my current, mm-hmm. you know, protocol, which I think is really smart. No, they should. That's exactly how I came across him because, and I remember he laughed at where I was at. And said, I, "I can't believe this is where they started you." You, you should tell them. You should tell the audience exactly. I have. I, did, I talked to. We talked. That's what we talked. We talked about that already. Where I said that the reason why we are we I ended up with him after you referred him to me was because I, my tests were coming back lower than when I started, and I needed a higher dose. And they were like incrementally moving me up. So and he's afraid like, of giving. Yeah, you- afraid of giving me a little bit more. And he's like, "I would have started you." So he would have started me higher than where I had worked up with them just based off of what my lab said. And the stuff that they were talking to me about wasn't even the stuff that he was concerned about. There were other readings on my test that he's like, this is the number we care more about, we're watching, and then more than anything is how you feel. So you tell me this, you tell me that, then I'm, this is what I'm looking at. You know, so- it's funny, it's uh, it's like any other field. Uh, I don't care what field you talk about, plumbing, doctors, whatever. There's people that are really good, and there's people that are not so good. And in when it comes to hormone therapy, uh, I think this is extremely true. I think mm-hmm. you have the standard, you know, basic, oh, here you go. Here, you're in the range. Don't worry about it. And then you have people who are really, really experts at it who say, okay. No, well, this. you can see that just from your your general practitioner and like how many of them won't even let you have. I mean, I, I get DMs all the time of someone who goes, I just did a test and my free testosterone is, our total testosterone is at 200 and something. And my my GP doesn't won't even recommend uh, TRT for me. Mm. So there's a lot of GPs that that don't they're not versed in this this field. Right. If they don't see anything like seriously happening to you, chronically happening to you, then they won't just you saying, Oh, you're tired or you have no energy or your sex drive low isn't enough for them to throw you on TRT. Right. They're still into like just treating illness instead yeah. of, of being optimal. Yeah, right? come back to me when it's broken. Right. Yeah. Come back to me when this isn't working or you've got anything some other- preventative, you just don't see that in any yeah, sort right. of doctoral. Could, could you imagine if you train clients that way oh uh, you know i don't know this i don't feel good with this workout my hip hurts no no no. trust me this exercise is great i've read the literature (laughs) no no no, this is plenty of this 
is the right amount of volume. This is what the science says. So yeah, yeah. Keep, instead no, of the person telling that's a you. Great, that's a great analogy and example. It's so true. And that, I mean, that's what, that's what, yeah. So I, to, to your point, uh, and I have been too, I've gotten a lot of DMs from people that are already on it. And they've told me like where their doses are and what they're doing. I said, you know what? You should at least do a consultation with them. Do a consultation with them and at least get him to look at your labs and talk to you and see whether you stay with their your current one or not. Uh, I think it's worth doing that in itself. And they offer that, right? You can just literally do like yeah, a have them just hey re evaluate what I'm currently doing. Let me know what you think. I'd love yeah. your opinion. Yeah, yeah. Just it's to see smart to do. Yeah, what's going on. Yeah. So um, I didn't ask you guys how your weekends were. What you guys were up to? I know you were. Doing a bunch of yard work. Oh man, shit. yeah, I was going crazy trying to get my house prepped and everything. Uh, and I didn't really anticipate putting my house up on the market, but it was just one of those kind of opportunities where we found another place. I was going to remodel and kind of like rebuild and make this whole thing work uh, where I currently live, but uh, turns out this was a better option. So I was just scrambling. Uh, they gave us like a couple days before we had to do an open house and. Okay, if if you know the current state of your house or you're living right now, where you're just like, oh, you know, I'm, you know, you kind of let things go over the years, and you're just like, yeah, whatever, I'll get to that. Um, uh, but then, okay, now you have you have like three days to get this thing like primo, like spotless, like everything like on point, and, and so. I was stressed the fuck out, you know, just running around. Like I've never done so much, you know, chainsawing and, and <laughs> you know, like clipping and, and, and digging and, and raking. And like, I, I was saw you digging up like your, your, your sewage or so. Why did you have to do that? What was uh, that so I, cause we get our, our, our septic tank uh, inspected. So, uh, in, or, in order for, for them to do it in the time frame because the schedule them is, is a big issue. So, there was a guy who kind of works for the, the septic company, but didn't have like all his gear and truck and all that. And was like, well, I could come, you know, evaluate your leach field or whatever, but you're going to have to dig it out and all this. And I can what? only come by tomorrow. And I'm like, tomorrow? <laughs> There's something out there. Ah! I don't even have like a pickaxe or nothing. And I'm and it's like really hard and like uh, gravelly kind of ground. So I was just like. Did you do it? Yeah, I did it. But it, yeah, it was Yeah, did was you see That's why I was like, why the hell is this guy digging that out? I thought they do that. I know. I was like, wait a minute. I thought I was like, and you still got to pay for it. Doing well to where I don't do this shit anymore. No, no oh, you okay. got to do this. Now, like, was this one of those situations? Because you told us before how like you'll fix things and you'll like have just your tool belt on, take your shirt off, and Courtney gets all. Oh was yeah. Was this one of those where like, hey well, honey, can you come look at this? Yeah, digging the yeah, tank. It would have been except like she was spinning around like doing oh, stuff. Man. We were both gone, so I wasn't getting any kind of like you know attention for that. I was just like on a mad rush to do all these things and and get it all prepped and ready to go. Oh, that's yeah. So yeah, I was doing that. Well, but, for for us because we you know we moved right, so moving is always a pain in the ass. And yesterday, Jessica and I were like, let's just do a day or at least half a day where we just relax let's mm -hmm. go out in the back and have mimosas which is you know it's a good time or whatever so i made some mimosas for us we hung out back there we bought this little pool for the baby and just put like real shallow water so i put them in there had a good time and you know we had some some you know you know 10 11 a.m mimosas uh, out oh, in the sun nice. oh yeah time. nice yeah. had a great time yeah, i love day drinking yeah oh and uh, uh, uh here's a plug for our sponsor zbiotics you know, in the past, it's so crazy how effective it is. In the past, if I had three or four drinks during the day, I even if I had it during the day, I would feel like garbage that night or the day after, no matter what. It's like I drink water. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not encouraging people to drink more, but man, what a difference. Yeah, and even for Jessica, who's very sensitive, she gets migraines if she drinks uh, alcohol often, quite often, nothing. Nothing at all. Katrina's mom just bought the big old value pack because I brought, by the way, I owe the, the studio four of them because she wanted, she ordered some, a, a sample pack originally or whatever the little four pack or whatever the small, I forget what the small package is, under 10, right? She ordered that, didn't come in because they're back ordered right now. So she asked if I could bring some over to the studio because we had that big party. Did you see the the wine bottle that she uncorked? I saw. Yeah, that. what yeah. is that? That's yeah. sick, right? That's like the, that so that was something that uh, Pop and her had bottled that before he passed, mm. and it was supposed to be a, a wow. special occasion. It was his five year anniversary that he had passed away, so that was what the the celebration was about. It was, and then also her finishing her backyard. Um, but she had it. She texted me the next morning. She's like, oh, my God, son, that Z-Biotic is amazing. And then she ran back and ordered the big old value pack of them because 
how amazing she felt after she goes i had so much to drink <sighs> yesterday and felt amazing this morning now, now have- you know what's interesting about it too is like so courtney she went on like to some party some birthday party and went on like one of those uh chardonnay cruises or whatever like the, through santa cruz that you can get on this the, the chardonnay and you anyways her her friends and her like got her kind of schnookered and i'm like at the house still <laughs> trying to like what? paint what schnookered it's a thing it's okay. like it's being that means drunk being, yeah it's okay. three sheets of the wind drunk right and so you know she's coming like they, they drove her back home and everything and she's i'm like oh my god like what happened like you were supposed to help me and we got into this thing and all that but like she was like just completely out of it and i was like we should try giving you a z-biotic now even though i know you didn't take one yeah. just in case you know like even after the fact i've done that before even after the fact it still helped a bit yeah no it helps yeah you know it, they're having trouble it's not ideal but it still helps yeah, yeah well yeah it's times. better than not you yeah. know the demand for the, their demand is so high they were having trouble that's filling. why she couldn't get them she ordered them last week and they didn't come in yet so she that's why i had to go grab some for her because she she did it anticipating the it's party from reorders yeah, it's from people getting it, yeah. getting some, using it, and then buy, trying to get a whole bunch more. Yeah, that's no, how it's, no, remarkable it's, freaking, it's magical, yeah. dude. It's dude, so hard. I got to bring up something about your shirt. Right? Oh, really? So I mean, it's this it's is my really pro- prophetic uh, in so many ways. Uh, but I wanted to kind of throw something out there, like so, Doug. If you could also help me on this in terms of like l- like looking for countries right now that are like have all kinds of. Uh, protests and are going against their governments. There's a bunch of them right now. Oh, worldwide. Europe is going crazy. Yeah, like all over the place. France, Germany, Italy, Italy. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the Middle East is like just exploding and uh, all this unrest. Uh, but I, I had heard this this sort of sermon and this brought it back to like the Book of Revelation and everything. And I'm like, oh my god, like it's it, like it was interesting because you, you started like putting all these pieces together of what needs to happen and occur before like the one world leader sort of takes over. But if you think about it, if every single country gets to a point where they ha- there's no trust in their government at all, what does that leave? Yeah, it's a vacuum. It, it leaves a power vacuum. Yeah. Then what? Damn. Then the lizards and the aliens come then in? Then the lizards No, come dude. In. <laughs> That's not what it is. No, Justin's no. theory... What I um, I subscribe to it. He sold me on this. There's a world leader that's going to emerge, and who are and what are the they going to be? Savior of It'll be all, Joe Biden. all of our because no. yeah, nobody trusts governments anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be Joe Biden. It's Joe Biden is going to be the, with three the Antichrist. Together. <laughs> no, by the way, Kamala, his VP, the worst rankings. She has the worst public opinion polls. Yeah, at, like I think in in history, if I'm not mistaken, uh, she's so disliked. But anyway, no, yes. your theory about the Antichrist being AI. That's it. So AI the emerges. World leader. So we're all going to emerge. So now our, our currency is all going digital. Government's going to all be you know merged together. And, and, and initially, AI digital form. solve all of our problems because it's so smart. So it just solves everything. That's you. the problem. And then all, all the billionaires are going to Mars instead. Yeah. I mean, what's I, happening? Th- now, this conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually pretty I'm funny just saying. About that. The Loch Ness Monster. They know, it's, big it's, monsters they know monsters. it's coming. So they're, they're building these these rockets to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Pay sure. attention, everybody. Uh, I'm just trying to put it out there. Like, you know, <laughs> put a smoke signal out. Like, listen, shit's happening. Hey, guys. I, saw, I saw a video. You ever seen like people who do hypnosis on people and they do like a show and they'll pull people from the audience and yeah. do hypnosis? By the way, it works on some people, apparently. You can oh, really yeah. hypnotize I've them. heard people. That- there was this one guy. You just reminded me of this. I hope we can find the video so Andrew can put it up. This guy did hypnosis and convinced uh, one of the guys that he was a Martian. <laughs> so he says, so, you know, how, what's it like being a Martian? And the guy goes, beep, bop, boop, beep. <laughs> <laughs> He's like made up his own language. I was wrong. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, the only problem with that conspiracy is that that goes against what we all agree that we believe, which is that the 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 first introduction of of like true like AI even taking over at all is going to be like built in built into us, not like a, a machine by itself. So right? it'll be an AI hybrid human. Yeah, hybrid human. Right. Somebody who starts to you know. Take over their eyesight, and then the part maybe, of their the, maybe the neural a long term plan, then, but they're really pushing oh, this oh, forward yeah. because oh. of uh, oh, you found the it. Pandemic. This is turn, turn it up, Doc. You gotta hear this guy. He tells him he's a Martian. Loosen up your arm. Loosen up your arm. Just let it go. No, let just follow my fingers. Look down. Look down. Oh, this oh, is on Viceland. Sleep. That's it. Sleep. Go, sleep. Let it go. So in a moment, when I count, <laughs> he's like, "What the fuck?" Those are his friends. Going to Mars. 
We've got you here, our first Martian when I count to three. It's one, two, three. Just sit up, open your eyes. Hey there, our first Martian. What's your first impression of the planet Earth here? Did you like it? Did you like it? What's your typical Martian meal going to be? <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> oh, oh, man. You, do you guys? Think, I mean, that's do you, creative. Do you guys think you would be hypno, you're hypnotizable? No, I don't. No. Really? No. It, I think you it only believe. works on certain people. Yeah, I think, right? you, I, think you have to, I think part of the process is believing it. Is it like yeah. a what is it? The Jedi mind trick only works on the on the yeah, only, Well, only these works. hypnotists they look for people who are Vulnerable. susceptible yeah, to yeah. Uh, what do they call it? Um, I forget the word. Cold oh, um, I know what you're trying to say. Yes, yeah, uh, suggestions. Suggestions. Yes, yeah, suggestions. So they'll ask questions to the audience to see who is volunteering, um, you know, a lot and, and that type of that's thing. That's what I'm saying. So, this, the person has to already yeah. somewhat believe that it. Yeah. Uh, Dude, for it to work. Okay. I saw. I saw one, and I know we're going long here, Doug. But I get just I like saw, vampires. You got to invite them in. I yeah. saw one where a guy got hypno. He he. People signed up for this, and they narrowed it down to the most susceptible people. And the experiment was, could we get these people to kill someone? Now, now they didn't. They they weren't actually going to kill someone, but they thought they would. So they they set him up with a gun. They set him up, and, and they what? gave him instructions. And then they played a song or something that triggered them to enact it's like something. Like the Manchurian Candidate. Yes, a guy actually did it. They hid a gun in a garbage. It was loaded with blanks. They did the thing. He went out, got the gun, shot someone, put it down, forgot all about it. Because they had convinced them that he didn't that that he wasn't part of the experiment, so that was part of it. They told him you're not part of the experiment. Then they told him that he did this, and the guy's like, "No, I didn't." They showed him the video. The guy freaked out so much that he sued the people and he lost his. He, he's like, "I can't believe I did that." Yeah. It was freaking frightening, dude. I, I can't believe they can get away with an experiment like that. They yeah, can do that. Maybe it was just bullshit TV, but I don't know. <laughs> yes, it dude, sounds like bullshit TV. Like, shit. how can you can't do that? Can yeah, you? I don't know, man. That's crazy. Yeah, Maybe you're hypnotized into right the book now. Chaos. <laughs> Hey, real quick, I hope you're enjoying the show. Check out Live On Labs. Head over to liveonlabs.com forward slash mind pump. Now, they have products that provide you with essential nutrients like B-complex vitamins or magnesium, very absorbable forms of magnesium, or glutathione, which is the master antioxidant. But what's different about Live On Labs is their delivery method. These are medically, medical delivery methods, or at least they were designed for medical use to ensure that you get those nutrients. A lot of the supplements that you're taking, you're not absorbing. You're just peeing them out, expensive urine. If you want to take supplements that actually get to where they're supposed to, Live On Labs is the best place. Again, it's liveonlabs.com forward slash mind pump. All right, enjoy the rest of the show. First question is from Ms. Denise Morales. When should you use a resistance band? During weight training, or will it benefit more to use it when you're priming your body? Yeah, both. Uh, resistance bands are extremely versatile, valuable ways of changing workouts, adding variable resistance, priming your body. Mm. You know, what's funny about resistance bands is they were not really considered, um, you know, like a serious exercise tool for a long time. And then you saw strength athletes really start to use them. I can't remember which powerlifting group did it. I think it was Westside Barbell. Were they the ones really? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know the Soviets uh, used well, them yeah, Soviets and did studies. Them. That's um, where they got it from. That's where they got it from, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and then you got strength athletes started using them, and they started crushing in competitions. And you know, initially, bands were like considered kind of wimpy, but it's hard to do that when you got guys and girls squatting and lifting as much as they did. Next thing you know, people started using them. I started using them myself uh, as variable resistance with squats and deadlifts, love them, and then use them for trigger sessions. Absolutely love them. And now a week doesn't go by that I don't use resistance bands. So I think they're extremely valuable. And one of the reasons why they're so valuable is their resistance gets harder as you stretch them out, which is mm -hmm. very different than what you'll experience with weights. Yeah, I think you need to explain machines. variable resistance for the the listeners to understand. Well, what so that if is. I have a if I have a band I'm doing a overhead press with. I may start here at 40 pounds, but as I stretch it out, it gets much harder. Now, the cool thing about this is as my arm extends, I tend to get stronger as well. So the resistance matches how my strength 
tends to express itself. So it's like I get more resistance right when I get stronger, which is kind of cool. And, and it's the opposite of what happens when you have a barbell or a dumbbell. Yeah. As you get barbell and a dumbbell, as you get closer to the end of the movement, it's much easier than what it is at the very yeah, beginning. Because the weight stays the same. Right. Mm -hmm. Or with the free weight, because it's working against gravity, you know, if I'm doing a, a preacher curl, it's heavy down here. But when I'm up here, it's not heavy at all because I'm just supported by my elbow. Whereas with the resistance band, it's always challenging. Do I think they can replace weights? No, but I think in addition to, extremely valuable. So, I mean, especially for priming. It's one of my favorite things to use them for. Well, yeah, and I think part of the case that we make for priming is that because uh, it's not that you can't prime with a machine or dumbbells or barbells, but you're you're more likely to get sore or do da damage by doing that. And the idea of priming is to basically kind of neurologically wake up yeah. a dormant mm -hmm. area, pump some blood. You're not trying to tear or break down really. And so bands are great for that because they don't do as much damage. So I see it, it's great to complement for the, the variable resistance that you're talking about. So it goes good with weight training. And then it also makes for a great tool for like on the go because I mean our little band kit that we have has I mean everything you need in this little pouch has it to where you can hook it up to a door all the different band resistance and I can get a great little workout in a hotel room real quick and so when you when it's convenient I think it's nice for that and again like we talk about other things on the show where here's an area where instead of programming you know resistance band workout for a week or two weeks or I just let it happen naturally. If, naturally, there's going to be a time where I'm on the go or traveling or it's convenient just to do bands. And so I intermittently throw that into my training routine. Yeah, speaking of the prime, I mean, I think sometimes it is helpful uh, for people to, to be able to connect more when you're actually like, um, you know, it, you have a tool that helps you to kind of fight against the resistance of it instead of creating that muscle contraction yourself. It's kind of a hard concept for people a lot of times to be able to squeeze and contract their muscles and, and, and get that kind of blood flow just, just you know, with, with their body weight and without any kind of like tool to kind of aid with that. So sometimes I feel, you know, rubber bands provide a nice uh, amount of resistance when you set it up to uh, kind of take your joint through full range, but keeping that nice consistent contraction. Um, you know, to focus on with that too. But uh, in terms of performance, it's it's one of those things if you start adding that in and you're really focused like on your power lift numbers or, uh, you know, kind of getting over that hump of a plateau that you always hit, it's such a, a valuable tool to add to um, kind of get you to, to hit those uh, you know, those certain points uh, with, with a bit more strength that's not going to damage quite as yeah, much. Yeah, it's if you consider how little space they take up and the fact that you can literally create resistance in any direction. So I can make resistance going down, diagonal, I could rotate, of course, going up. If you consider those things, they're one of the most versatile tools you could use. And I'll give you an example of how you would use it for bodybuilding or body sculpting or whatever you want to call it, right? Let's say I'm doing a dumbbell fly. Great exercise, right? Great isolation exercise for the chest. At the bottom of a dumbbell fly is where I'm feeling most of the resistance. As I come up towards the top, even if I have 35 pound dumbbells on my hands, the resistance against my chest gets much lighter because gravity is not pulling sideways, it's pulling down. So up here, there's really none. Mm -hmm. How can I use bands to augment that exercise so that I feel lots of resistance at the squeeze. Well, what I could do is I could attach a band around my wrist or the dumbbell and attach them out. So now at the bottom, I have the full weight of the dumbbells, but as I come up, now I'm engaging the resistance of the bands. And then here at the squeeze, I have lots of resistance with the band. So extremely valuable and it's literally limitless in terms of creativity. Here's another way that I use them. In fact, the first time Adam and I worked out together years ago when we first met, mm -hmm. uh, I did this. We were doing a deadlift workout. Mm -hmm. And in order to help lock out something that I did with the bands is I attached them to the bar and I attached them to the cage, which is in front of me. So when I stand up with the bar, the bands are pulling down, but also away from me. So it encouraged me to pull back and kind of create this lockout. You know, the, the first time I really saw their value, back when I grand opened uh, Santa Teresa 24 Hour Fitness, they, the cardio area was open first. The weights and machines weren't open, but we were selling memberships and selling personal training. So all my trainers use bands. And what was crazy was, and I remember we had these meetings and it was like, okay, people may complain, make sure you give them a good workout, explain the benefits. Literally within a week, all the members who were training with trainers were 
enjoyed working out with bands more than they did with other equipment. They loved it. They absolutely loved it. To the point where when we had a full gym, you could see the trainer still incorporated bands in almost every single workout. They feel good. They do. I always feel good after I do a band workout. Next question is from The Real Rashton. In your opinion, are squats with dumbbells, goblet, or front-loaded as effective as barbell squats for targeting the quads? They could be more effective depending on the person. Yeah. Now, th- here's the drawback, right? A barbell sitting on your shoulder, especially if you have a good, if you can rack it well or support it well, you can load yeah. much heavier. It's hard to load something that substantial, uh, you know, with a kettlebell or even or your dumbbells. So, uh, I, yeah, I prefer a, a barbell for that reason, mainly for the loading reason. But, yeah, it is tough to get in the technique and, and you, you have to have really good wrist mobility and, and have wrist and shoulder mobility yeah. Yeah. i mean a lot of people can't do a, a, a front squat very well no mm-hmm. so that the, we use the goblet squat a lot or at least i did in training clients um for that exact reason i mean i would prefer to do a front loaded squat it'd be ideal because to the, your point you can load it so it's not gonna, you're not going to be able to hit it as hard but the truth is a lot of clients just didn't have that shoulder and wrist mobility or it was extremely uncomfortable for them to do that so I tended to do a, a goblet squat uh, more often than not. So for that reason, it, it can be more effective. So if you have a client that can't do it, then of course it's it's great. Good point. But- and speaking to that, uh, I, I, and you showed me this, Adam. I almost I, I did lots of goblet squats and and you know front loaded squats with with kettlebells and dumbbells with clients. Exactly for what you for the reason you said, but never almost never for myself. I liked the barbell. I liked that I could load it with a lot more weight. I wouldn't be able to do this with dumbbells. So I kind of never did them on my own. I did a leg, leg workout with Adam. And I don't remember, we did like one or two exercises first, probably a squat and some split stance, something. And then what you did is you had us elevate our heels. Mm-hmm. So we stood with our heels elevated. So we had a, I don't remember what it was, but imagine a block under your heel. So you're almost up on your toes, but not quite, right? And then we did, we held the dumbbell in this kind of goblet position and really slow, went all the way down, came up and squeezed the quads. Now we're both pretty strong in our legs. We didn't use, I think the dumbbell we used was 50 pounds, I yeah. think, which is light, right? Yeah. That's not even a bar. That's a little bit heavier than a, a, a bare barbell. Oh my God, the workout I got in my quads from that. And till this day, uh, when I really want to target my quads, especially after I've already done heavy squats, I'll do that exact exercise, elevated heels, hand on the dumbbell. And it's like, I mean, it hits my quads harder than almost any other exercise. I, I love that. I'd say it's one of my favorite ways to, to kind of finish off a leg workout because I'm already taxed from the backloaded squat or the Bul- Bulgarian squat. So I've already hit them hard enough. Now I'm just getting pumped. And I love doing that. Next question is from Jules Tillman. Can you put barbell squats and barbell deadlifts in the same workout? Or is it better to keep them on separate days? I mean, you can. Is it ideal? No. Yeah. Both of those exercises load the hips and the lumbar spine so much that if you do them both hard, the risk of injury does go up considerably. Now, one thing I would almost never do is do a heavy deadlift before doing heavy squats. I think that's dumb. I could I could see how that would really that would really increase yeah. the risk of injury. And the reason why is you're taxing your yeah, low, back, low back, which is so important that it's completely uh, strong going into a loaded back squat, right? Yep. So that's the main reason why you would never go that direction. Because people always ask that. that you've, we've said that before in the podcast. I'm like, I don't understand. Why not deadlift before squatting? Why can you squat before you deadlift? Yeah. Now, I, I, I've, I'll i do this, I, or I could do this, kind of lighter barbell squats, and then do my heavier. But I would never go heavy, heavy, yeah. and train lots of sets for both. It just loads the lumbar so much that I could see that, the, again, the risk of injury is really, really yeah, high. risk versus reward. I mean, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> like, it's, it, like, you see CrossFit. Like, you can, do, <laughs> you can do whatever you want. You just throw some shit on the board and, and get you after it. You do some ring muscle ups, yeah. too, right in between. It doesn't mean like. it's ideal, you know? So, like, you got to listen to your body. Like, when you're putting that much demand on stabilizing your spine is specifically, you got to be conscious of that. Like, when, uh, you know, your form degrades or when you're, like, overworking all the stabilizing muscles just to keep your shit together it's probably not a good idea yeah i mean i i never do it but i also don't think it's that bad unless you're loading heavy yeah if you're if you're doing five or less reps so and you're and you're you're moving at 80 percent plus type of deal then i think it's a terrible idea for the risk versus reward to your point but i mean if it's 
15 reps or you're doing light or it's a technique day, I don't see anything wrong with it because the the, the likelihood that you're really going to hurt yourself on 15 reps or 12 reps, the load that you have to do in order to do 12 or 15 reps, you'll probably feel your form degrading before you actually hurt yourself and can set the bar down. Yeah. I mean, consider this, right? The, the area that tends to be, not always, but the area that tends to be the weak link in a squat or a deadlift is the lower back, right? So if somebody hurts themselves on a squat or a deadlift, it's usually the low back, definitely in a deadlift, often in a squat, because they both require such strong stability from your core. That Because you're using your, you gotta understand when you're listening to this, your hips are so powerful. You got these big, powerful muscles that drive the hips. And you're either arm, you know, extended holding a barbell or a barbell on my back. The thing that connects all of that is the lumbar spine and the core. And if that fatigues to the point where the hips are using more weight than the lumbar can support, now you're starting to run the risk of injury. Mm -hmm. And because they're both so intensive in that area, probably not a good idea. This is why you'll rarely see people load them both heavy in two exercises. Now, you will see barbell squats and a stiff-legged deadlift, but rarely will you see people do a stiff-legged deadlift the way people do conventional deadlifts, mm -hmm. where they're doing singles, doubles, and triples you know, type of stuff. It's typically higher reps focusing on form, technique. So in, in our programs, the only place you'll see them in the same workout is I think pre-phase and MAPS anabolic. And it's really not hard workout. It's not like you're doing tons of sets. Yeah, of it's each. like technique. So yeah. I can exactly, see it on right. a technique day, right? Yeah. So if I'm trying to teach a client to get better at squatting and deadlifting, I want to increase the frequency of both just for technique reasons, right? Like or for practice reasons, I mean. So I don't I I don't have that much of a problem with doing this three times a week if it's if the intensity is low. Mm -hmm. If it's low intensity and it's all about getting my client to practice squatting, getting them to practice deadlifting, and and that's how we go into each mm -hmm. workout is thinking like that. I'm not worried about their low back being fried because I'm not loading. But if I'm loading, I think it's a terrible idea to do those two exercises in the same workout. Next question is from Fulvio the Castle. Is lifting barefoot more beneficial in any way, or should I just stick to my favorite shoes? Sure. Yeah, it depends. I love it. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of, again, as a kid, trying to go help my dad do construction in the summer. So this is the only time I'd ever do it during the, during the year I was in school and whatever. And I remember him telling me, because I would wear gloves sometimes to handle, you know, heavy things and tiles and concrete and wood. He'd tease you. And, uh, and he'd say, you know, I never used them when I was a kid. My hands just got really tough. Now, of course, my dad at nine years old was doing this and didn't do with this into the summers. So he did this all the time. That's what he did. He worked. But I'm like, oh, cool. I'm going to get my hands tough. So I didn't wear gloves and I immediately shredded my hands mm -hmm. to the point where I had to tape them up and wear band-aids and, gla and gloves again. And my dad's, you know, he kind of laughed and he goes, you know, I should have told you, you got to go slow. You can't just jump into it because you're not ready. This is what happens to some people with with barefoot training. Yeah. Is that they go, "Oh, if I train barefoot, it'll strengthen my feet and my ankles." And but meanwhile, they've always trained in supportive shoes. Yeah. They've always had some kind of a heel rise. So then they go all the way barefoot all the time and then they wonder why they develop plantar fasciitis mm -hmm. or hip issues or knee issues. Too hard, too fast. You are not ready. Like this takes some time to to get to because if you look at like an anatomy picture of the bottom, just the foot, forget the ankle and everything else just the bottom of your foot, it is covered in muscle. Those muscles need to be strong and stable enough to support you to do your heavy lifting that you normally do in your supportive shoes. Yeah. I just, so. I wish I did it more. I mean, there's definitely, a, it's beneficial to work your way in that direction, I would say. Definitely, like, takes a while. So just walking around barefoot, um, getting used to that is the first step. Uh, but then sort of building upon that, but to to be able to to feel your way through and connect to the ground and and stabilize with all those little muscles in the bottom of your feet and also like articulate your toes and and find those those points of of you know like ground forces so what happens when you get in up into power and the pinnacle of your training is you know how you can distribute you know that force and and, and to be able to to create more ground forces it starts through your feet and what your feet are doing are so 
crucial and essential. And so this is stuff that I try to teach athletes all the time. And so it is beneficial to, to get rid of the shoes so you can really kind of feel your way and feel like the, the, the forefoot, the, the, the pad of your foot. And, you know, when you're, when you're doing anything athletically, you're never flat footed. You're not, you know, your heels aren't on the ground. In fact, most positions like out on the field, if you're, if your heels are on the ground, I'm yelling at you. Yeah, yeah. Because you're not able to, to transition. You're not able to cut and, and move and be dynamic. And uh, so, you know, these are all considerations to, to have, but there's definitely, uh, you know, there's a progression. So you just got to really like slowly, gradually introduce yourself to just walking around a lot more frequently, adding frequency to being barefoot, then start to kind of load, you know, basic exercises like lunges, like, you know, things where, uh, you, you know, you start adding dumbbells and then you start doing, you know, unilateral training, then work your way to the heavy loaded barbell situation. So this is close to home for me because this has been my journey the last like five or six years. I had uh, terrible foot strength, had terrible ankle mobility. I couldn't break 90 degrees in my squat uh, and my, my feet were sleepy as shit. And I wanted to get to a place where I addressed and fixed all that. It just didn't happen overnight. Like when I got to the point where I was working out barefoot, I did a lot of just barefoot walking first. And I would start there. Very few people, like so people hear us talk about that or they see a video, maybe one of us posts and we're working out barefoot. And they're like, oh, I'm going to start doing that. It's like, well, what you didn't see was that I just got in the habit of when I'd come home, I would just for now and took my shoes off. Like when was, how many people walk in their house and then just they, take their shoes off for the rest of the day. They decide like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm home from work. I'm mm -hmm. not going to wear shoes the rest of the day. How many people walk barefoot outside? Yeah, and then go yeah. outside. Nope, like, right. So it started like that for me where I, I would just, as soon as I was done working and I'm home, shoes off. And then I would walk around my yard and be outside and I would just stay with my with my shoes off as much as I can. If I, I love going to the beach and walking in the sand uh, with no shoes on. And so I just started doing that a lot before I even decided to exercise. So there was no exercise. And then when I even started to exercise with no shoes on, it started off with mobility work, not loading the mm -hmm. barbell back squat. It was just me doing ankle mobility and walking, doing farmer walks, real light stuff and working on posture, stability exercises. That was when I was working on that jump to balance stuff. And so I was doing a lot of balancing things with barefoot, but not loading a lot of stuff. Once I got my ankle mobility in a good place, my hip mobility in a good place. I had been walking around barefoot. Then I started to load the barbell and actually squat barefoot like that. But that was a progression over, you know, two, two and a half years and, of doing and, that. And I mean, you, you really need to stress that because I remember you you going mm -hmm. through this, especially in the beginning. And there were a couple of times you had to take a couple steps back. Yeah. Because I remember like at one point you're like, oh my God, I could squat barefoot all the way down. Then you added a little bit of load. Oh, got to back yep. off again because yep. now my hip's bothering me. It takes a while. And kid, consider this. What you train is what you get good at. So what do I mean by that? So if you look at like um, like a boxer, look at a boxer who trains with big gloves on. They get really good at boxing with gloves on and blocking with gloves and understanding where they are in space. You take those gloves off and they lose a little bit of, uh, of that, right? So it's like training with a weight belt. Like you could get good at a weight belt. That means you're not going to be as good without a weight belt. But if you don't train with a weight belt, that means you're not as good as train as other people who train with a weight belt. So whatever you train is what you start to get good at. And if you've always trained and you majority of the time walk with your shoes on and it's been most of your life. Yeah, start with just taking your shoes off. This is going to take years. Yeah. This isn't like, oh, next month I'm going to do this. This is literally years and years and years. I remember you saying with your son. You know, you have a, a your your son now is you know how old is he now? You're now two oh, two years old. You always have kept the shoes off, yeah. and I remember the first time he fell was because he had shoes on. Yeah, because he 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 was used to walking. Oh, he's still he's very clumsy with shoes on. It's the funniest thing ever to watch him watch him because now it's I've trained him so much to be barefoot that I can only keep shoes on him for a few minutes, and then eventually he'll he'll sit down and he'll he'll pull them off. Feels weird, I'm yeah, sure. So oh yeah, and you can see when he walks around, he's not as fast, he's not as stable. When he's got shoes on, because he's so used to not having shoes on, and so I've and some of the family I know they've seen that. There's like, aren't you worried then? You don't you don't want him to not be able to do shoes. I said I'd much rather him be uncomfortable in shoes than uncomfortable barefoot. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's got a strong. Plus, base. he'll get plenty of opportunities to work. Yeah, yeah, him. exactly. The, the shoe thing, I'm less worried about. It did. It threw him off. The only the only time he's ever fell was actually the the first time that Katrina put shoes on him and took for a walk, and then he, he fell forward because yeah, his balance if you've was never off. seen a picture 
of a hunter-gatherer, modern hunter-gatherer's feet, just from the top, it does not look anything like the average person's foot. Their toes are splayed out, like very strong. They're meaty. gnarly looking. Yeah, and our feet are all like toes smashed together. I feel together. like Max's are starting to look like that already. He has like really wide, flat look. His feet are like this. Mm -hmm. They look like yeah. little hands. Yeah. I mean, you, you can see Courtney the way he looks like toes. toes. It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I'm sure I hope she... you're listening, honey. <laughs> no, dude. Yeah, dude. She can like spread them out and grip things and like, like ew. <laughs> so just don't feed me something with those things. Hey, did she, did she tickle you under the, yeah. Yeah. She tickle uh, you under the covers? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god would, no that's terrible i'd freak out look if you like our information head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides we have lots of guides that can help you with all of your fitness goals again it's mindpumpfree.com you can also find all of us on instagram so you can find justin at mindpumpjustin me at mindpumpsal and adam at mindpumpadam